Hello everyone, my name is Pavan. I am from European Galaxy team in Freiburg, Germany. In this video, I will show you a standard single cell RNA sequencing analysis on Galaxy. And this analysis workflow involves some pre-processing of the count matrix and then normalization, scaling, dimensional multi reduction, clustering, and then marker gene identification at the end also cell type annotation. During the analysis, we also uh, visualize and inspect the data throughout the analysis uh, with some cool plots. So let's get started. So I'm here, I'm using singlecell.usegalaxy.eu. You can also use uh, any other public servers like usegalaxy.org or usegalaxy.org.au or any other public server that uh, supports all these tools. So in this single cell subdomain, the main advantage is actually all the, the tool panel is sorted out. So you have only a filter list of tools that are mainly used for single cell data analysis and also some workflows that support the analysis. So let's get started. So first thing is to open the training material. So I usually open it from the inside the Galaxy. You can also open it outside, but this is very handy. So to open this, click on this, uh, hat icon and then go down until you find single cell topic click on it and then today we are going to do this clustering 3k pbmc's with scanpy so if you haven't run this tutorial please try to look at it this is kind of a preparation for our current tutorial clustering so you need to have a filtered or kind of high quality count matrix ready for for our today's uh, uh, analysis. So try to look at this and this is this produce input data for our current tutorial. So let's get started. So as the title says, it's clustering 3K PBMC cells. So with ScanPy, ScanPy is a tool suit, a Python tool suit, which is one of the popular tool suits for single cell RNA sequencing analysis or single cell data analysis in general. And the data set we are using is, as I said, PBMCs. Uh, it's supposed to be 3K, but actually in reality it contains 2,700 single cells. And it's also a very popular data set. Actually, it is used everywhere in to showcase uh, lots of tool suits. For example, ScanPy has a tutorial on how to cluster these 3K PBMCs. And there's also a CROT uh, tutorial, and there's also a bioconductor tutorial around this data set. And the data is actually made by, I think, generated from 10x genomics, and also publicly available at 10x website if you want to look at it. So the data, sets, the data set contains mainly three files. The first one is genes, TSV. It contains a tabular file, most commonly two column tabular file with ensemble gene IDs and gene symbols. And there's a barcodes file, which is simply a text file, a tabular a text file with simply barcode information. So the barcodes that are used for these 2,700 cells and there's a matrix file. And the matrix file contains the counts information. And the format is called matrix market exchange format. So we'll look at it in, in a bit. So first we get the data from here into uh, Galaxy, so we have all the data on Senoro. First, copy the links and then click outside this window so that you enter Galaxy again. Maybe first we create a new history, and then if you already have something, then rename it to something uh, useful. So, clustering 3k PBMCs uh, with scan pi. Okay, and now Let's get the data. So we copied the links and then go to paste or fetch, paste them here, and then start uploading. Just wait for a few seconds or maybe a minute and then it will be ready. Okay, my data is ready here in the history. So let's quickly look at them. First we have here genes TSV file. So the genes TSV file is a two column tabular file where the first column is the gene ID. Here we have the ensemble gene ID and the second column is the gene symbol. 
okay and then we have the second file is barcodes csv uh, by the way uh, here we have 32738 lines which is 32738 genes yeah the second file is barcodes csv which has 2700 lines that means each of these lines so each of this sequence corresponds to cell barcode associated with each of the cells we have in this data set and then the third file is matrix file so the matrix file is not a uh, row by column matrix format so it does not contain everything but only the uh, the fields with non-zero values and that's why it's called matrix market format so it's an efficient way to store the information or store sparse matrices so generally the single cell data is very sparse so it has lots of zeros because you don't see expression of all the genes or in many cells so you have lots of zeros in this matrix so that's why this format especially just throws away all the zeros and keeps only the information about cells and genes that have at least one count. So the way you read it is as following. So you have here the index of the gene and here you have the index of the cell. Okay, so, so we have here 32,738 lines. So this says 32,709th gene in the first cell has four counts. And in the same cell, the 32,707th line has one count, and so on. So if you look carefully, the 32,708 is missing here. That means it must have a zero value in the first cell. So it just throws away everything that has zero. So if you look at this, the you see lots of genes are missing here. That means those genes have in this first cell a value of zero. Okay. And if you want curious how many zeros are there, you just multiply 32,738 times 2,700, and that should give you 88 million. And then out of this 88 million, we have 2.28 million non-zeros. So it means only less than 3% of the uh, data is non-zero. So that's all about the matrix format. Or oh. now we will look into uh, a way to store all these three files together and this is done using a format called undata yeah so undata is the most very popular format in single cell data analysis especially if you're working with uh, scanpy tool suit and it's a it's a binary format it actually stores all these three files together in one single object or one single file so it contains the count matrix it contains the annotation of variables or features so in this case the variables or features are simply the genes information it also contains uh, annotation of observations so in this case again the observations are cells so it comprises all this information together into one single object and this is what we are going to use throughout this tutorial and this is the most of the time this is the input to the most of the tools and also the output of the most of the tools yeah so to create uh, an undata with our three files here that we just load into galaxy we need to use a tool called import undata tool so just click on this if you are inside the uh, the gtn within galaxy that should open the tool so import undata now what you have to select is create undata from what we have here is matrix market and from cell ranger so we see the matrix is already here it's loaded that's correct and then here we use uh, what format uh, the, f the two files the barcodes and genes are so we say it's we already know because it was published data so we know it's it was generated from cell ranger v2 the cell ranger is a workflow a pipeline that is a proprietary uh, pipeline from the 10x uh, genomics. Usually you get these uh, three files, the genes, barcodes, and also the matrix files from directly along with the sequencing data. And this is usually analyzed with uh, cell ranger. So the first thing is, yeah, here you select genes TSV, that's correct. And then here the barcode. So just make sure that you don't have matrix here, but barcodes, otherwise, you'll get an error. 
okay and then we want to use gene symbols as our index so it means the second column here as our index not the first because usually the gene ids this ensemble gene ids are hard to read so these are much the gene symbols are easy to read so easy to understand what they are and then let's run the tool okay here's undata that was created from these three files together so usually undata is much smaller so it's at seven megabytes the input data was actually around more than 25 megabytes so it's much smaller so you can try to view it from by clicking at the i button but it actually shows so around some random stuff because it's a compressed binary format to view the contents of this file we have to run a tool called inspect undata let's click on this and then select the full data that's here and then general information about the object run the tool we will also queue some more inspection jobs so we will also look at the count matrix the genes and also the cells so first look at the count matrix so again the same input you can go for the full data matrix but it takes really long time so let's go for a chunk of the data matrix so, uh, we just take only let's say 100 cells and then run the tool again run again the same tool or you can just simply <laughs> rerun it it generates us it, it loads the same tool again and now we select the observation annotation which should generate information about the cells and rerun this again and select variables that should generate a text file with uh, genes information so the, da the data is ready now so let's inspect one by one the first file is here the general information about the undata so it says it's an undata object with 2700 cells or 2700 observations and 32,000 variables which are genes and the variables annotation is simply gene ids there's not much information added yet and this is uh, the, the count matrix i uh, don't want to click on this because this will take a while to load so also you also please don't click on it just expand this and see it contains lots of zeros and sometimes maybe uh, a non-zero value so that already sh tells you that it, the matrix is very sparse and then we have observations which is simply uh yeah same as before all the cell barcodes but there's one extra line so we don't see it here but the extra line is simply the header line which is empty and then we have the features of variables which also added one extra line here which says uh here we have gene ids information and now the the main column what we are using is uh gene symbols because this is what we use to generate the undata object now once we have this undata what we do is uh, uh do some pre-processing yeah the pre-processing here is simply uh yeah filtering of the genes or filtering of the cells so we can filter out those genes which are not expressed in in most of the data or we can also filter out the cells or which have no genes expressed that means maybe the damaged cells or maybe filter out the cells with a lot of uh, expression that may be a potential uh, doublet and we also do some data normalization and also selection of the features so selection of highly variable genes and so on so the first step is to filter the genes based on the minimum number of cells expressed so filter out everything all the genes that are present in less than three sorry we filter out all the cells all the genes that are genes that are present in less than three cells uh, and this threshold here the three is kind of depends on the data so you can also go for 10 for example but not not more so don't don't put a higher number here so we can start with a, a low number and then we will visualize the data and then based on the the data how it looks like we may just uh 
go for higher thresholds later but first yeah go with three or five that should be good enough so scan by filter and then we take the undata so it loads undata here now filter genes here the minimum number of cells expressed and then select all right three so here again select minimum number of cells and run the tool okay it's ready now so if you look at it we generated an h580 file which is an undata file and our input is also an h580 file so in the most of the tutorial we start with the undata file and we also generate undata so it so the basically the whole tutorial is using undata and generating undata again if you want to look into what the contents of this file you have to uh, use inspect undata but we just quick and we can also quickly look at this uh, expand this data set and also can look at this here in this window it says we have 2700 cells and 13714 genes so that's actually a significant drop in the number of genes because we filtered for them that's roughly a bit less than two-thirds of the genes are gone because they are not expressed in most of the cells and now we will do further filtering so you can read here about uh, the advantages of actually filtering for the downstream analysis so one can also filter by the cell size the total number of uh, counts also the number of genes uh, number of expressed genes per cell so we will do this in the later steps or you can also filter by the reads that map to mitochondrial genome this is also a very common uh, quality control to check the quality of the cells so usually the higher concentration of mitochondrial genes uh, represents damaged cells so we will do this this part now first uh, to do that first we have we have to actually find out uh, the mitochondrial uh, genes so usually mitochondrial genes start with uh, mt and dash so that's uh, a common pattern uh, for the mitochondrial genes so what we do is we use this tool called manipulate undata and then we flag all the genes starting with mitochondrial and give it a name so in the resulting uh, undata file we will have in the variables annotation a new column with mito with all the mitochondrial genes with a true value and all the non-mitochondrial genes as a false value. we'll look at it in a bit so manipulate undata and then we have to use the function flag genes starting with the pattern so here go and then see flag genes start with the pattern i insert the pattern for example here mt for mitochondrial and then we call this as meto or you can give any name you want but you have to remember this and then here we select the previous scan pi output which is the ninth one whatever in your case just select the previous one and run the tool as i said it uh, adds information or, or flags the genes with my flags mitochondrial genes with true or false maybe you can also look at the look at them by just using this inspect under the tool so we use the, the output of the manipulate uh, with variables because that's where it adds because whenever you work on the genes you have you have unupdated variables uh, annotation whenever you work with on cell with cells you get an updated observations okay so variables and run this tool so this will be run after this is finished oh, let's wait okay now our undata is ready so here the data set 10 is the undata where we filter where we annotate or flag the genes that start with mitochondrial or mt and then we call them m meto here and here we looked at the variables annotation so if you look at this file you see we had uh, gene symbols gene ids the number of cells per uh, number of cells this gene is expressed and then we also have here meto this is the column that is added now meto this column says whether this gene is a mitochondrial gene or not 
Okay, so as none of them are starting with MT dash, this simply says it's false, false. And if you scroll down, I don't know, like, uh, maybe somewhere at the, the bottom, for all the genes that start with MT, you have in this column true, indicating that the gene that start with MT is a mitochondrial gene. Believe me, if you scroll down to the bottom, you will find them. And now we go further to do few more uh, generate few more quality metrics by the way i'm not i'm not uh, renaming the data sets here so it's actually a good practice to rename the data sets uh, if you're analyzing your data but here i'm anyway working with only one data undata file so i know exactly so the last result is the undata that i want to use as input for my next step so be careful if you have multiple data sets uh, try to rename them properly then you are not you won't get lost so now the next step is to compute more or uh, some QC metrics. For this, we use ScanPy inspect and manipulate tool. And then we calculate PP, calculate QC metrics. So, so okay, that's the, the, the default one. And then as I said, select the one with the last one, I would say just where you actually flag the mitochondrial genes and keep everything and here keys for boolean columns where to identify you want to control for and then here we give metal and what else i think that's all and then let's run this so this should generate a, a lot of qc metrics so some of them if you look at it, some of them are added to observations so some of them are added to variables so you see the undata object actually takes care of it so everything that you compute on cells is added into the observation data structure and everything that data frame i'll say everything that is uh, uh, computed on genes is added to the variables data frame so here you see for example uh it computes something called number of genes by counts. So then it per cell, so it just adds them here and also total counts, which are just simply the total number of uh, uh, reads for each cell and that adds it here. And for example, here it does, maybe you can see, for example, number of cells by counts, which is analogous to here, number of genes by counts and also percentage of dropouts or total counts and so on and then we use this information to visualize the data so you can you can look at them for what they mean so you, you can just read read upon all this information later on but for now we will uh, plot some information so we use scanpy plot for plotting it has various plots so you can plot plenty of uh, things using this tool and there are different types of plots so for example just let's click on this and then you see here then it says method used for plotting and the method is simply you see it has like a ton of different types of plots violin plots dot plots tracks plot matrix heat maps whatnot so u maps so you have lots of uh, yeah many different types of plots to choose from and so here we choose uh, generic what is it well uh, wait a violin plot and then we plot the number of genes by counts total counts and percentage counts meter so these three are here for example so these are observations total counts and the percentage of counts uh, by mitochondrial genes so you can choose any of them but these are three uh, quality metrics that we are interested in currently so let's look at them so here we select again the, the previous output and we select violin plot so no it's a generic violin plot and we don't plot all the variables or all the observations but we plot a subset of variables or observations and the subset here is the number of genes by counts total counts personal so you, you can just simply 
copy this and uh, paste it here or you can take anything as I said from here and then plot them and what else we have to go is yeah so we want to also go to violin attributes and display them in multiple panels so we go to the violin plot attributes and here display keys in multiple panels click yes and then run this tool so we will also now plot a couple of scatter plots so the first thing is again the same input data set the we use scatter plot I've used the uh, scatter plot has XY coordinates. The first one we use here is total counts against number of genes by counts. So total counts here and the number of genes by counts. So be careful. So if you're typing it, uh, try to type it correctly. So whatever you put in this uh, in these parameters should be from one of these here. Okay. And now let's uh, let's plot that. Use the layer attribute. No word. Okay, yeah. So run this tool, and then run the same tool again, but this time we plot number of genes by counts here on the x, and on the y we plot percentage of counts for mitochondrial genes per cell and then let's also run this tool and then once they're ready we will look at the plots so now let's look at the plots the first one is the violin plot and here we see three different stats that uh, associated with the cells information so here we see the number of expressed genes by counts and the total counts the total means the total number of reads per cell and here you see the, the percentage of mitochondrial reads per cell okay and each dot here represents uh, a cell and here what you see is uh, most of the cells have anywhere between 500 to i don't know 1500 genes that are expressed and there are a few extremes where we have 3500 genes expressed per cell and in such violent plot you see if uh, the based on the, the the density of the data the the violin is expanded or brought here and the next one is the total count so we also see here the similar distributions most of the cells have anywhere between again i don't know 500 to 4000 uh reads per cell and there again extremes for example some cells this cell has uh, 16,000 reads and here we see the percentage of mitochondrial genes or mitochondrial reads that are uh, per cell map per cell so here again most of the reads or sorry most of these cells have anywhere between 0 to 5 percent of mitochondrial reads and there are some extremes which are actually here you see in this particular cell there are more than 20 percent of the reads are coming from mitochondrial uh, genes that indicates that these cells might be damaged but we will look into the other plots to confirm this observation so the next plots is the correlation between the total counts the total number of reads per cell and the number of expressed genes by count. So this is again each point is here a cell. And you should usually observe such correlation. So if the number of reads per cell is increasing, and you should also see the number of expressed genes should be increasing. And there's a strong correlation. If you see this is not correlating, that might indicate that the total counts, the all the reads are might be coming from only few genes so that's something to be uh, taken care of and the next one is again something to look at uh, very carefully which is percentage of uh, reads that are coming from mitochondrial genes versus 
the number of expressed genes by counts. Okay, and here we see uh, usually such a flat uh, line of counts uh, of cells. And then here, uh, let's take an example here. So this uh, uh, cell says, okay, there are 2000, roughly 2,500 genes expressed, and it has 2.5% uh, of these genes are, or reads are coming from mitochondrial genes. And there's one other extreme here where it says 20% of the uh, reads are coming from the mitochondrial genes, but it has only I don't know, maybe uh, 300 genes expressed. And you see this, uh, usually if there's a pus reads from mitochondrial, higher percentage of reads from mitochondrial genes, you see they are most of the time they, they have low, lowly expressed genes or low number of expressed genes, which is a clear indication that uh, this is a kind of damaged cells, right? So they have higher percentage of uh, mitochondrial content, but low number of express total express genes so then we throw out this information for example everything that has less or more than five percent of the mitochondrial content can be thrown away so let's go further with these observations and now filter for the low quality cells so now we see that from this plot here we can put a cutoff here, everything maybe which is less than 200, uh, which every cell that has less than 200 expressed genes can be thrown away and all the uh, cells with more than 5% of mitochondrial content can also be thrown away. So the first filter is filter cells yes that's correct and now we say minimum number of genes expressed so not minimum number of counts but minimum number of genes and we say okay oh, throw away all the cells which have less than 200 genes expressed and run this tool and subsequently we will run another one which actually a cut off on maximum number of genes expressed so and now Make sure that you're using the previous step, the output of the previous step. And here again, maximum maximum number of genes expressed. So we still have filter cells. And here 2,500. So that's again, a uh, kind of cutoff which says, which tries to uh, omit all the uh, cells with uh, which do not fit into the distribution of the remaining cells. So this cutoff also indicates something like uh, doublets, uh, cells with, uh, the, you know, droplets with uh, more than one cells. So we throw away this uh, because these are also really highly expressed, which is abnormal, that does not fit into distribution. Okay. And now another filter subsequently is uh, filtering based on the percentage of mitochondrial genes. So again, run uh, manipulate on data tool. In this case, uh, we will filter uh, by observations. And then we have this key called PCT counts meter. Okay, and now filter for observations or variables and now filter for observations and the key to filter is I copied it and pasted it here percentage consumito and we say okay everything uh, we keep only everything all the all the cells which have less than number less than five Okay, that keeps only the cells with less than 5% of mitochondrial genes content. Oh, yeah. And while you're doing the steps, you can also observe how the how the undata is changing. For example, first when we run the scan per filter on the cells, you see uh, 
the number of we, we lost uh, five cells only and then we do the another step which is filtering by no no actually we did not lose anything here with 200 filter uh, 200 threshold and with 2500 the upper bound we lost five cells only so it means it's yeah the thresholds are more or less on the extremes and then when we filter for uh, mitochondrial high high percentage of mitochondrial genes uh, cells with high percentage of mitochondrial genes we lost uh, quite a bit so um, not not a lot but still uh, i think more than 60 cells are so lost now we will continue to normalization and scaling so let's uh let's wait until these jobs are finished and then go back and check whether you got the similar numbers as, as shown in the tutorial okay now let's check the undata so i got 2638 which is the same number as in the tutorial so i hope uh, all the filtering uh, went well and now let's go to the next step and the analysis which is normalization scaling so there are various uh, types of normalization so here we use uh, a simple normalization uh, which is by this function pp normalize total where we actually normalize all the cells to a target sum of 10,000 reads so uh, to use to run to do this uh, normalization we use scan by normalize tool and then yeah by default it's pp normalize and then the target sum is 10,000 and we have to add a key after normalization so all the normalization counts we will store it in something called nvrm and then we run this tool once we normalize, we also lock transform them uh, and then store or keep this information in so-called raw attribute, which we will use later in the analysis towards the end where we do the differential expression anal analysis. So the next step is to lock transform the normalized count. So we take the output of the normalization. So here the 19th and logarithmize data matrix with log 1p and then just run this tool and the next step is to freeze this data or this current state into a raw attribute so yeah this is what we use and then again make sure that you're using the the previous run the output of the previous run and then run this tool and then we will use this information later so the tools the the parameters of the tools that asks you whether there is a raw attribute that stores that already stored the lock transformed normalized counts which we use for differential expression analysis at the end so the next step is feature selection so the feature selection, we select a subset of uh, genes that have specific expression profiles across the cell. So, for example, if we have a, if we have a gene which is uh, which is expressed but has a stable expression across all the cells, that does not uh, define any particular cell type. So we are interested in genes that are expressed but also variable across the cells, and these or what we also call as highly variable genes and these genes usually at the end uh, will be used for uh, defining clusters and eventually the cell types so to do this we use uh, a tool called scanpy filter because we want to filter some genes and the filtering criteria is to annotate highly variable genes so we are still uh use okay sorry we are still using uh the the latest one so 
make sure that you have 21 here the last uh, output the previous output and then here there are different methods uh, different flavors of identifying highly variable genes so some of them actually allow you to just set number of highly variable genes For example also 0 to v3 it says okay just give me 2000 highly variable genes and it gives you 2000 genes and here we're using uh, the classical CIRAT uh, method, which is actually a dispersion-based method, where it calculates a disper each gene dispersion across all the cells. And then we will select uh, only the genes with normalized dispersion greater than 0 0.5. And I think that's all okay so just select the previous data set and run the tool <coughs> and after this uh, you scan by plot and we want to plot dispersion versus mean for genes and then also use the previous output and run the tool So in this step, we, we just annotated the highly variable genes. So we did not filter them yet out. So just to see what happened, uh, maybe you can use, I don't know, uh, inspect on data tool as we were doing operations on variables. So we get the key index notation of variables, and then we will see what happened to this on data and how the highly variable genes are stored. So now let's look at the data or the annotation of variables. So uh, here we have this tabular file with annotation of variables. So here we see each row is a, is a gene and running the previous tool added these four columns. So the means dispersions and normal dispersions and it also added a column with Boolean values. So Called highly variable and it either false or true sometimes here that indicates that this particular gene is this gene is a, a highly variable gene okay and you can also look at the plot so this is where you see on the left side uh, normalized dispersion on the right side non normal dispersion and basically what you see here the black black dots uh, indicate all the highly variable genes and the dots in the gray or the, the remaining set of genes. So to find out how many of them, we have to filter, or actually we already flagged them, we just have to filter, yes. So we use manipulate on data tool, choose the, the, the last output, which is 22 here in my case, and then filter for observations or variables, so here, uh, I don't know where to find, yeah, filter for observations variables, and then we, we want to filter for variables. And what we want to filter for is by key, and we want to filter for highly variable genes, and this is a Boolean, and we want to keep them. It means we only keep the genes which has a true in this highly variable column and everything else will be thrown away. So once it's finished, you should have something like 1838 genes, uh, whereas before we should have 13,000. So that already threw away a lot of genes. So now we work with this 1838 genes further. Okay, mine is finished and it has 1838 genes, same as in the tutorial. And now let's proceed. Uh, in this step, now we perform two operations. The first one is regressing out unwanted variation. So this, in this step you can also uh, perform some kind of batch correction if there is a batch effect. So this is not a, this should not be done always. So we just want to show how it is done. So 
is not it this is usually based on the data so not a must always and after this we also scale the data so that for each gene the variance across all the cells is one and the mean is at zero which uh, in the downstream analysis avoids any biases that are coming from the highly expressed genes so the first optional step as i said uh, is removing the uh, variation from total counts and percentage of uh, mitochondrial genes. So we use PP regress out, and then let's use these two variables. Oh, sorry, we want to not on element of layers, but actually the keys. And let's run it. And after this, uh, what we do is scale the data. So for this, we use Canpa inspect and use PP scale. Yes, it's here. And then we said zero center. Yes, and the maximum value is 10. So this is just a clip or, or any values after scaling the maximum values. So yeah, this is actually a standard deviation, the maximum standard deviation. And now we'll run this tool and make sure again you're running on the previous output. <coughs> so after scaling, the next step is dimensionality reduction. So this is one of the important steps uh, in the analysis. Here the dimension or a dimension is a gene. So in this case, if you look at our data, we have 1838 genes. It means 1838 dimensions. So what we are going to do is our ultimate goal is to cluster cells. So we have 2638 cells. Uh, to cluster or group. So we want to cluster 2,600 cells based on expression levels of 1,830 genes. This is uh, usually a computational intensive task to look at 1,800 genes uh, to cluster these cells. So that's why usually we go for dimensional reduction. So we do not keep all this 1,838, but we do something else. So we are not throwing away anything here. So we still keep the information from 1838. And there are methods such as uh, PCA, which takes a linear combination of these expression levels of all these genes uh, across the cells to define so-called principal components. And each principal component captures the variance across the cells. So the first principal component is also called PC1, so often captures the most variance and then the PC2 captures the, the, the next best variance and so on. And this is one of the popular method or to initially reduce the dimensions of this higher dimensional data. And this also helps in actually uh, visualizing the data clearly so because as humans we cannot perceive more than three dimensions so it's impossible to uh, view 1800 dimensions even if we plot this so it makes uh, it reduces the computational work in downstream analysis also enables us effective plotting so let's uh, use PCA to reduce the dimension so now uh, this each of these PCs are a kind of a reduced dimension so we are taking we use 1800 genes and now we convert them or kind of uh, translate them to 50 pieces which are 50 reduced dimensions that have information on that capture the information on the expressions of all these 800 genes so let's use this scan per cluster and now we used we use pca pppca here and we want to compute 50 
physical components that's correct and then we use the type of pca full pca let's keep it oh i think that's all we don't have to set anything and then run the tool while it is running let's uh plot the result so we hope it will work out and run smoothly so to save some time let's start plotting so we use scan by plot to view the pca overview so so we use here pca overview uh, here and then we go to the plot attributes and then insert component one and two so that means we want to uh wait uh is it yeah that means we want to uh view the pc1 and pc2 pc1 and x-axis pc2 and y-axis we can also go for another plot with pc2 and pc3 and then we also set the number of panels per row to two because we're just uh, plotting two. So if you want, you can insert more components and then also keep it four. Okay, let's also run this and wait. So now let's look at this plot. So here we see, as we expected, two plots, uh, one between PC1 and PC2, and the second one is PC2 and PC3. Uh, each point here is a cell and then you you see there's already started forming some uh, subgroups of population cell population so he, here we see one two three or four sub populations and here we see maybe one two and there are some extremes here maybe three or four different sub populations so but we, it's still not clear what they are or yeah, so you just see there's something happening here. So in order to find out what defines or what is actually happening in these uh, subpopulations, maybe we want to look at the genes that are ranked high in these species. So for that, uh, you can use again scan by plot, but we now we use PCA loadings. So uh, I just type here PCA loadings that's probably faster and now I use one two three so it means I want to find out which genes are highly ranked in the first three PCs and then on the tool so let's look at this plot so here we see the ranking so the first one is the best and the last one is yeah probably not the best so we see here some genes the top genes cst3 and kg7 pf4 or pppp so let's use these genes again uh, to plot the pca overview and then see how it looks like so we will again use pca overview plot the same plot as before okay we can or even run this the previous plot not the previous one the one before just read on it and then use these three top genes from each of these pieces and then run it uh, so now let's look at this plot so here we see some colors okay just uh, as a reminder we took top genes for each pc so this one from pc1 and there's one from nkg7 pc2 and another one here the second top gene from pc3 and now we plot the values the expression values of these three genes here on again these different principal components and now we can see here cst3 uh, is 
yeah, highly expressed here, and then the difference is actually projected mostly on PC1. And in PC2 and 3, you don't see much. So there's no cell subpopulation which defines, which is defined by CSD3. Similarly for NGK, NKG7, you see there's a clear separation of this cell population in PC2, and they're also highly expressed. And this can also be seen here on PC2, here is a, a subset of cells that are going in this direction here, which is uh, different from these population of cells. And for the third one, this PPVP, it's uh, even much more clear because this is not at all uh, separate these two pieces, so this nothing can be seen here, but if you come to PC2, three because uh, this was the highly uh, ranked gene in pc3 you can clearly see a subpopulation of cells which are predicted here in pc3 and also have highly ex high expression now we will uh, continue to determine the number of pieces to keep so if you remember we first when we carried computer PCA, if you go up, we used, we computed a number of uh, 50 principal components. So, but we don't know yet whether these 50 principal components uh, capture a decent number of, decent uh, amount of variability. So maybe there's still some noise in this top 50. So you want to find out how many of them have captured uh, a decent amount of variability and how many of them are not required anymore for our analysis. So for that we use, uh, we generate so-called an elbow plot. So click on this and then use PCA variance ratio and use the log values. So it's called PCA variance ratio. Yeah, and then use log values, then it will be easier to visualize. So now let's look at the plot. So in this plot, we see the ranking of PCs uh, by the percentage of the variance they explain. So here you see the PC1 explains the most variance and then PC2 and so on. But after some time you see the yeah, there's not much going on. There's saturation on the variance to explain. So we have to uh, set a hard threshold on how many PCs we keep. So in this case, maybe we go can go for PC4, but this PC5, 6, these are also comparatively better than this. So maybe we set a threshold where there's a plateau, there's nothing happening. To be, uh, uh, to have a round figure, maybe we set, uh, uh, we keep top 10 pieces. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's all. We keep top 10 pieces and then we continue. So, so in that case, we don't have to do any type of filtering on the species, but we just remember that we observed this. And then in the subsequent steps, whenever we asked for how many pieces to use, then we always say, okay, use 10 pieces, that's all. So with that, we are finally at the clustering of cells. So with the clustering, we want to find out a subpopulation of cells that have common expression profiles. All right, so this is done in two steps because we are going to use graph-based clustering. So for such graph-based clustering, we first have to compute a neighborhood graph and then cluster this neighborhood graph. The neighborhood graph is computed by simply uh, putting uh, cells together, or connecting cells together, so the cells uh, having similar uh, expression profiles are put together and then the, the edge weights uh, represents uh, how similar they are. Once we have such a graph, we we'll use uh, some graph uh, clustering algorithms to partition them into cluster based on 
kind of hot spots in this graph so the highly connected regions uh, form a cluster i would say so the first step is computational hybrid graph this we use uh, scan by inspect and manipulate and we use computation of neighborhood graph yeah the pp neighbor the first one here and then we use let's say 10 neighbors per uh cell so 10 nearest neighbors per cell and then we use number of pcs we determine in the previous step to keep 10 pcs and then we also risk we get the heart threshold and we use umap for computing the connectivities among the cells i use the euclidean distance metric and that's all run it so before continuing to clustering let's quickly look at the, the neighborhood graph that was generated so for this we first have to uh, compute the umap uh, on this neighborhood graphs or not 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 umap but the embed the neighborhood graph in the umap space so uh, we use scan pi embed and then we use the output of the pp neighbors and here we use tl umap and that's all i think and then this will calculate the umap embeddings which we can plot in the next step so once we have it we will use pl umap method for plotting so we can just just plot using pl umap but we can also use we can also color this umap with for example the genes the highly variable or no highly uh, the genes that are actually highly ranked in these first three PCs. So we also take these and then plot or color the UMA by these genes. So let's take the here, choose the previous output and then PL UMAP because we have UMAP embeddings and then here keys are simply these three genes. and run the tool my umaps are ready let's look at them so here we see three umaps so it's actually one umap but uh, for three different genes so yeah as you can see the umaps is much better compared to the pca before so by the way umap is also uh, a dimension reduction algorithm non-linear dimension reduction algorithm so that's why it actually captures uh this uh sub uh it embeds this uh, cells much better than the pca uh and you can clearly see there are three different subpopulations or three different groups or three different blobs of cells which might eventually form three clusters or maybe more clusters so for example here we see cst3 is highly expressed here uh, but maybe a bit low here this part of this uh, blob and then nkg7 is surprisingly not expressed in this whole cluster but only a part of it so only this part here but not here and not at all everywhere else and pppp is is uh, is a strong uh, expression in this part of this cluster so it can assume that we might get one cluster here maybe multiple clusters here one cluster here maybe one cluster here so it's definitely more than three clusters i would say at the end so now let's continue to clustering so for clustering we use an algorithm called levine which is one of the graph based clustering algorithms which is also called community detection it tries to find out yeah i would say sim simple terms communities of closer 
uh, highly connected uh, regions of the neighborhood graph. It has one of one important parameter called resolution. And for this data set, it's recommended to try between 0 0.4 to 1.2, but uh, this parameter changes from data set to data set. So usually it is recommended to use higher uh, resolution if you have a larger data sets. So with the lower resolution, you get larger clusters or less number of clusters. With higher resolution, you get more number of clusters, but smaller clusters. So let's run this. Now we use the wine and then the resolution, what we said is 0 0.45 as per the publication. And then run this too. As Levine is a clustering of cells, so the information about the Levine clustering must be stored in observations, annotations. So if you want to look at uh, how it is stored, you can maybe run, I don't know, run inspect undata tool with key indexed observations on 36 and this should give you an idea how this information is stored so if you look at the or just expand the the wind step and then you see just scroll here in the observations if everything is correct you should see the one here so it says it stored some information about clustering and if you look at our observations data frame if you scroll to the end we see here a column called wine and then it has something information some numbers so the number says which cluster this cell belong to so in this, in this case the first cell belonged to cluster zero and the second cell belonged to cluster two i don't know the sixth cell belongs to cluster five and so on yeah so now plot the the wine clustering again the umap with the clustering information so we can just rerun this tool pl umap the same information but uh, here we say Levine and then run on 36 so let's look at the plot now so okay I should have used only two plots per panel okay uh, that's fine yeah, so we have now annotated the clusters, or colored the clusters uh, here on the UMAP. So we have seven clusters in total, and then here's the coloring of them. And then if you look at the our genes that we found before, so CST3 is highly expressed here. That means it probably defines cluster one. And NKG7 is more expressed at this corner of this blob here, which probably means it defines cluster five. And then PPBP is really dominant here, that is simply cluster seven, for example. But we still have to find out what defines this cluster, what defines this cluster here. So we don't, we just found only three from the genes that we found before, but we still have to find uh, the genes that are highly variable in these other clusters. So this process is usually called as finding marker genes. And these marker genes usually define the clusters. And once we found out the marker genes, we can actually also define uh, cell types uh, based on the marker genes. So this is usually done by uh, detecting the highly differentially expressed genes between the clusters. So we use, uh, for example, a t-test or or Wilcoxon ranks and tests. So in this case, we are going to use Wilcoxon ranks and tests because 
yeah just because of the time constraints so for, for identification of the marker genes we just not only use highly variable uh, genes but also the whole the whole set if you remember we stored I think somewhere in the pre-processing we store all the genes in raw and then we continue to highly variable so is if we look at the raw attribute all the genes must be there so let's continue so as I said we skip the t-test but uh, use the Wilcoxon rank sometimes so we use TL rank genes groups as the method for inspecting and now we use the, the key as Levine key observation to groups to consider is Levine and then we say as I said we have to use raw attribute if present we and we have it then it uses the whole set of genes not just the highly variable genes And then we say okay compare each group to the union of the rest of the groups so that's what it said and we want to have 100 genes or 100 top differential expressed genes per list and we will use Wilcox and rank some test okay and run this tool now for the first time let's rename the file because we will use this file several times after this step so now I rename the file and let's first maybe plot or just inspect oh, let's do it, both of them so plot uh, what do we plot here we plot uh, PL rank gene groups rank genes groups number of observations so number of genes to show 20 and the number of panels uh, 3 should be enough And then we don't need y axis to be shared. And we also inspect how this information is stored. Uh, once this uh, differential expression test is performed, it is stored in the unstructured annotation. So go to the uns, uns object, and here we say rank gene groups and run it. Now it generates multiple files, not one, but one, two, three, four, five different files. I think we will look at uh, names, and then it has all the names of the genes that are differentially expressed per cluster. So now let's look at the potential marker genes. So first let's look at the plot. So here we have multiple plots and showing the the top rank gene. So zero versus the cluster zero versus the rest, cluster one versus the rest, comparison cluster two versus rest, and so on. And the genes, what you hear is uh, sorted dis in descending order by score. And we can see the same information here, but in a text file. So we have. All the clusters and then these are the genes for example in cluster zero this is the top uh, ranked gene uh, or highly differential expressed gene compared to the remaining clusters together and it's uh, this list is a uh, sort of descending order uh, we take for example in usually a top set of genes maybe top 10 or 20 per cluster and then try to look at uh, genes and then get an idea of what this cluster might be so what cell type it might be and there are also other files here so they have the similar format as here for example this one has z scores and this one has log two fold changes and so on for the same gene as we've seen seen before for the top gene this is the log two fold chain compared to the others and so on 
Uh, now let's take this this first set of genes. So the genes uh, that are in the first row, which are the top uh, uh, highly very highly ranked genes one top highly ranked gene per cluster. And uh, we assume these genes are kind of uh, represent markers per cluster. And then we look at uh, several plots. So the first thing is uh, a stacked violent plot. So a stacked violent plot. And then we take this list. Okay, not with, with commas, so maybe we take it from here. Take this list and the grouping key is Louvain. And we have eight clusters. We have a raw attribute and we also use custom figure size. So if you have more genes or if you have more uh, clusters, just adjust this height and width accordingly and we also swap axis and the violent plot attributes we don't use strip plot and that's all we don't have to change the colors let's use the default colors and then see so let's continue so here's the plot and the colors in this plot or maybe we look at what the axes are the axes here on the x-axis you have the clusters 0 to 7 and on the y-axis the the top gene so the ldhb was the top gene in cluster zero list is the top gene in cluster one and so on <coughs> and you see here the color represents the mean median expression group so and you see the violin plots as you saw before and the, the width defines the number of the most the number of cells in this uh, area and the color for example here you see clearly some of the genes are not at all uh, expressed in some clusters for example a nice example is here so pf4 is really dominant in cluster 7 only and expressed not expressed anywhere <coughs> so in ideal case if if the top the top one gene that we took is the very dominant one we should see something like this in this case so we should see only a diagonal uh, line with expression and everything else must be light blue or white completely but that's usually not the case because we see that some genes also express in other clusters for example uh, the CCL5 is expressed in cluster 3 and as well as cluster 5 and then sometimes you also see that uh, is for actually a DPA1 was uh, the top marker gene for cluster 6 but there are other genes which have high expression for example LIS and CD74 have much more high expression than the gene that we selected for this cluster but that's okay because this is just a median expression the expression is not the only uh, factor that that defines this cluster but also how variable this gene is compared to other cl other clusters <coughs> so that's how you look at this now let's continue to another plot which is simply a umap but this time we plot all these genes these top genes along with lewine here and see how the lewine looks like so pl umap the keys are all these genes, the top ones, and also the one here. I reuse the raw attribute and number of panels per row uh, must be somewhere here. And the plot attributes is not four but two. And then let's plot it. So let's look at the umap. This was the umap that we previously produced, and colors represent clusters zero to seven and as we know the genes that we selected are in the order of the cluster so the first gene here must be a representative or a gene that is top ranked in cluster zero the second gene is top ranked in cluster one and so on so the first gene must be in this case this gene whatever we have here on this plot must be highly expressed here compared to the other clusters let's look at it 
So LDHP uh, is from cluster zero. So this is highly expressed here and then low expression in the other clusters. And in cluster one, we select a list. So it must be in cluster one here. You see, this is highly expressed here. And the next one should be in cluster two. So that's cluster two here and CD74 in cluster two and so on and so forth. At the end, we see PF4 is in the last cluster, cluster seven. Yes. Yeah. So that's how you validate. And then you can clearly see, okay, there, there might be yeah set of genes that actually defined what these clusters are. How these clusters are made. And now let's go further to plot top 20 marker genes uh, for each cluster. So in this case we take top 20 genes per cluster, not just one cluster, so top 20 per cluster, and then we plot the, this the expression as a heat map and then we see whether these top 20 genes are also expressed in other clusters. Okay, so for this we used, we will use rank gene groups heat map. So I will type heat map and then this last one, rank gene group heat map. And number of genes to show is 20. And an important attribute is we use raw and also compute the Computer dendrogram. So use raw and compute and plot a dendrogram. And yeah, the input is always this. And let's run it. Let's look at the plot. So this plot is a bit hard to read. Uh, let's try to understand it. So here we have on the left the living clusters. So 0, 3, 5, 2, 1, 7. So these are not ordered because these are. We, we try to uh, draw a dendrogram, so they're actually clustered. And the dendrogram can be seen here. So, and then the clustering is done by the expression levels of top 20 genes. Where do you see this information? It's here. So if you look at this, these bands are equal width. And these bands, so you say the columns here, each of them is a gene. And we have here 20 genes, top 20 genes from cluster zero top 20 genes from cluster 3, top 23 genes from cluster 5, and so on. So the columns are top 20 genes per cluster, and the rows here, we see there are a lot of them, the rows, each row represent one single cell. So in cluster 0, we have lots of cells, so that's why cluster 0 has bigger or more number of rows here, and cluster 7 and 6 have low number of cells, so that's why we see them as tiny. Uh, sets. So that's the information and now the way you look at it is, is this here. So here you see 0 to 7, the, the, the more the brighter colors represents, the green represents a high expression, the, the darker colors, this blue represents no expression at all. So in the ideal case what you should see is all the top genes in cluster 0 must be expressed in cluster 0 all the top genes that you take in cluster 3, which so for example here, must be only expressed in cluster 3. The top genes from cluster 5 should be only expressed in cluster 5 and so on. So it must be, or not must be, it should be in either case, a nice uh, diagonal uh, blocks where there's green color. But that's not usually the case because as we saw that uh, there are always set of genes which are uh, commonly expressed in among different clusters. So for example, here uh, we have in cluster 3 some set of genes, these 20 genes here, highly expressed in cluster 3, but the same set of genes are also highly expressed in cluster 5 too. Uh, but there are some specific cases which are really uh, specific to cluster. For example, uh, in cluster 5 you see really expression levels which are really high here, a bit in cluster 3 but not everywhere. And there are also other cases where cluster 6 has expression levels only in cluster 6 and so on. And and, and the, the, the worst case scenario is here. In cluster 0, you have these top 20 genes in cluster 0, which are expressed, of course, in cluster 0. But they are the same set of genes also expressed everywhere in all the clusters. 
So this is usually the case if you start with a larger cluster, then you, your top genes probably expressed everywhere, except this uh, you'll see, yeah, more or less these top genes define which cluster it is. So the next step is comparison of marker genes between clusters. So, so far what we compared is we take one cluster and then try to do uh, Wilcox and Wrexham test uh, against all the clusters together. Well, you can also use the same test to compare with respect to a specific group. So example here, we are comparing cluster zero with cluster one. You can also compare cluster six with cluster two and so on. So two sets, so it's a pairwise comparison. Uh, um, but I'm skipping this test so you can, if you're interested, you can continue. It's not much different from what we did before, but just, just comparison of two different clusters only. I will directly continue to the our next step, which is cell type annotation. So, so now we have list of genes and then we list of top uh, ranked genes per cluster. And then we take this list of genes and then you need to go to an expert uh, in this area. Or if you already know what these genes represent, you try to guess what this, what the makeup, what type of cell types they make up of. And then you say, okay, you try to minimize the set of marker genes. So to take out everything that is not uh, commonly, you uh, that is commonly highly ranked in different clusters. For example, uh, C. CST3 was commonly highly ranked in other clusters, so we just take out only ones which is highly here, but not in the other cluster. So we try to define or define a set of the minimal set of genes that define a cell type. For this, definitely you need uh, some domain expertise. So if you are if you are new to this, uh, you can also go and then check the literature to find out which genes are uh, market genes for which cell types, or you can also go for this BangalorDB to check uh, yeah, with your list of subset of genes to test which uh, uh, cell types they're usually coming from. So here we use this set of marker genes here, and this set of marker genes are already defined in the original tutorial where we took this uh, data, uh, data from, so we just use this but in, in for your data set, you need some expertise on defining the set. There are also automatic methods for defining this market genes, uh, but in the end, you still need a domain expert to define what cluster, what cell types are, what are the cell types based on these market genes. So now we have market genes, and then we define what cell types are they based on these market genes. Now we will go and annotate. So we and out the cluster zero is possibly CD positive T cells, cluster two is B cells and so on. So we use this information now to change our Louvain clustering. So instead of zero to seven, these numbers, we add this strings here, uh, the cell type really information. So for this, we use manipulate undata tool and then here rename categories of annotation and this categories of annotation is the key is Luwine and the new categories, so just copy them and then make sure that this order, what you put here, follows this order. So zero to seven must be in this order. Okay. So Luwine and then the list is in the correct order as the Luwine clustering. And then run this. While it is running, we can already visualize it. So, oh, after it's finished. So we again visualize UMAP here, PL UMAP on the manipulated data. And then here, UMAP and then key is again the vein. And then we use raw attribute and then go to the plot attributes and the location of legend is on data and then you see per cluster uh, what cell type it is clearly written on the cluster and you can ignore the frame this doesn't matter so you can also keep it or ignore it this is just a different way to generate plot 
run it and wait for a bit. So let's continue and look at this umap here. Now it looks much better. So instead of zero ones, now we annotated them with the cell type that we discovered from the market genes. And now we can clearly see, okay, this set is B cells, and then here CD14 positive, CD4 positive T cells, CD8 positive, and can so on. So that's uh, how you annotate your cells, uh, or not cells, uh, the clusters with the cell type and plot it. Now let's continue uh, to the final step in this tutorial, which is again plotting the expression of these marker genes for the, the cell types that we annotated. Okay, so we take now all the marker genes, so the set that we defined here, all these marker genes, this all this set here on the right side, this set here, and then and then we use and then we see how they actually uh, are expressed in different cell types. So in idle cases, again, these two should be expressed highly in this CD. Four positive T cells, and this one should be only in the CD8 positive T cells and so on. Let's look at it. So this is again a bit of complicated plot to even to set the parameters. So here we uh, copy and paste all the uh, marker genes and then we have to do a bit of uh, fiddling here to get a nice plot. So let's do it together. So last one and it's called dot plot. And here we again set subset of variables and then here we have the grouping is again Louvain grouping and we have eight categories or eight groups. And then here if you go down we say we have right attribute compute dendrogram and then here start uh, giving information. So we first give a group of variables and the group of variables is from this list. So the first two variables or the first two genes are the marker genes for CD4 positive. So then we say okay the gene 1 and gene 2 are for CD4 positive C cells. But uh, uh, the problem is here, not the problem, but uh, something to keep in mind is we don't say gene 1 and 2, but we say okay, gene 0 to 1, so it's, it's a bit weird. That's how the indexing is here. So we say okay, gene 0 and gene 1, which is, so we say this one is gene 0, then this one is gene 1, gene 2, and so on. So gene 0 and gene 1 have CD4 positive and the gene 2 which is third one is in CD8 positive and so on. And sometimes we also have multiple, for example gene 7 to gene 9, three genes are uh, defining NK cell type and so on. So let's put this information. So first one is gene 0 and 1. So the first category starting from Gene 0 to gene 1 is CD4 positive, and then gene 2 is CD8, or actually gene 3, but yeah, we we'll index it gene 2, and gene 3, 4, 3 to 4, now CD14 plus, and gene 5, 6. Take your time to fill this. Takes a while. And seven to nine, as I said, three of them, seven, eight, and nine. Seven, the end index is nine, so seven to nine is NK. And here, 10, 11 is dendritic, so 10, 11, and then 12, only one gene here, I think, yeah, so 12, gene 12. And then we have one more gene which defines the cell type here. The last one, 13, 13, so in total we have 14 marker genes to define our eight clusters, so our eight cell types. And then the color palette we use is uh, the color palette here. 
is the first one and then let's run this so now let's look at the plot this is again a bit hard to read but let's stay together again so here we see on the x all the marker genes and the y here <coughs> all the cell types right all the clusters maybe <laughs> On the top, we see the categories that we defined while running this tool, these parameters, that's the uh, categories that we defined. And we again start with the easiest case here, which is uh, megakaryocytes, where there's a really strong uh, influence of this marker gene PB, PPBP on this cell type. So you see that PPBP is only expressed here. So none of the other clusters have this gene expressed so it says the size says the fraction of cells the percentage of cells that have this gene expressed so in the other cell types here or you see in the other cell types this is not expressed at all and only in this cell type it also has really high expression so for example here you also see in cd14 positive a really tiny dot here which represents uh which represents that it's uh, actually expressed but the expression is quite low and then there's another example here for example uh, we see that this gene is actually a marker gene for this cell type here but it uh, is also expressed in for example nk cells and there's also another case here in the nk cells this should be a marker gene for nk cells but it's also expressed in cd8 positive t cells and so on so you don't see always that uh there are sometimes you see a really a huge uh, set of correlation for example this uh, list is not correlation or say expression so the list is expressed more or less everywhere but it's uh, expressed mostly uh, well, has higher mean expression in cd14 positive cells which is actually the the uh, one of the marker genes of the cell type and this same uh, gene is also same marker gene is also expressed for example in other cell types but that's that's fine as we saw that these genes or these marker genes are, are shared among different cell types so that's still fine that you see such expression levels in different also in different cell types that where it is not a marker gene i think with that we are at the end of our <coughs> tutorial so if you want to check your results if you're stuck somewhere you can always take this history control history and there's also full workflow to run if you want to run in one step one click not one step and yeah that's all uh here in this in this uh tutorial we showed uh, it seems we showed uh, a lot of plots but this is still really a, only a handful of plots uh that can be drawn but you can actually explore a lot so if just from the data that you have in the history if you try out different combinations if you try you can generate thousands of plots uh, using this data and you can investigate various uh, different stuff different quality metrics and so on and we did not go through all of them but yeah try to run different uh, tools try to plot different stuff and then uh, get more insights into the data so that's all for this tutorial and thank you.